what is the past, present, and future of the biosphere in the light of science. So uh, first, let us consider the past. Now, past, as you know, of uh, um, the biosphere uh, is evolution. It's more than 3.5 billion years old, and it has been going on for quite a while. You know, this is an incredibly long time. Now, there are two major challenges here immediately. It's, uh, it's, the, the, uh, it's towards the beginning, and it's towards the end. The origin of life is a notoriously difficult problem, and we don't know for this reason, because we don't have a convincing scenario for the origin of life, whether life is likely, uh, very unlikely, moderately likely in a planet like the Earth. We, much, we know even much less about whether under radically different chemistry or geology life uh, could start or not and with what probability. This we are going to see. Uh, as you will see the report about the presentations of Martin Rees, he as an astronomer is also concerned with question how frequent uh, the life there might be in the universe, in our vicinity and so on. But the scary thing is that actually it might very well be the case that we are the only intelligent life in the universe, but that means that the value of the biosphere is much greater in that case, and then our responsibility for it is much greater in that case. Now, towards the end, you know, the origin, origin of intelligent life, that is, again, something that we don't know. What I can tell you, however, that uh, it's very unlikely that uh, given the fact that there is life on the planets, that intelligent life would be that common unless it is spreading. You know, once it has taken a foothold, it could spread and then it could multiply. But independent origins of intelligent of life, it, I, my expectation is much smaller than uh, for life itself, which might actually be small if enough. So this is a conditional probability kind of thing. Um, uh, one more thing I want to say is we don't know what kind of intelligences there might be, and that's again a very interesting problem, just as we don't know what kinds of life there might be. We are extrapolating from, from one experiment, and that's the biosphere. Everybody, as far as we know, uh, uh, is related on the current biosphere. Now, when we want to understand the process itself, I must uh, tell you a few things. First of all, it remains true, it's absolutely true, that nothing in life uh, makes sense except in the life of evolution. So evolutionary theory is at the center of the biological sciences beyond any doubt because of this um, ontological and epistemological reason. Uh, but it ha it's, not in a f it's not a frozen science. Uh, you see, it has to become deeper than it is today, and it will become deeper. Let me give you an example from another field, chemistry. Chemists uh, uh, were quite happy for quite a while with the classical notion of chemical valences, right? That uh, different atoms have different valences, and therefore they can form molecules in various stoichiometric combinations. That's lovely, but that didn't allow you to understand the nature of the chemical bond. It was a phenomenological concept. And then, through quantum mechanics, knowledge has become deeper. Now, in that sense, evolutionary biology is becoming deeper as well. And that, I can predict in the next 25 years, there will be a lot about that. We are going to ask questions about evolvability. What makes a certain lineage more or less evolvable? That means, you know, uh, will it respond to directional selection faster or slower? What kinds of things there are that can speed up evolution? What can slow down evolution? And there are two related concepts. Evolution and learning is one. How, to what extent are they related? A learning here, evolution out there. There are indications that they are more intimately related to one another than previously thought. And then there is the idea of niche construction. You know, here is a constructed niche. It's, you know, it's one of the uh, biggest natural buildings that you can, it's a termite mound. If you, have, if you have seen at all in your life a well-organized city beyond Singapore, then here is one. Huh? It's amazing, but you know, it took a few million years to work it out for evolution, but now it's working uh, incredibly well, so that's a constructed niche. What you are seeing around you, it's also a constructed niche. 
right? So that's different from what people, uh, geneticists used to say, that I inherited my nose from my father, and that's in, in interesting for genetics. I inherited my watch from my father, and that's not interesting for genetics. Here the two things are actually coincident with each other, because they are actually inheriting the bloody termine mound from the predecessors, right? So the two things go hand in hand. Now, challenges for biodiversity at the present. You see that there is a problem, undoubtedly. And uh, let me mention a few facts. The f uh, one of the facts uh, that uh, is true that the rate of background extinction of species in the biota is a few species per year. That's the background. Ex that's for natural reasons. Now, the human-induced human extinction of species is much faster than that, to the extent of 1,000 to 10,000 fold. If it continues like that, we might, in the year 2050, have lost 50 percent. That's one half of the existing species of the world. And that's a man-made mass extinction. It's not a joke. You have to do something about it, because you don't know when the whole bloody aeroplane will fall down. You know, you remove the screws one after the other, and for a while you are quite cheerful, you are drinking vodka or whatever. But there will be a point when the damn thing will fall down, and then you will pray, oh my God, all my sins that we have done together. Now, the, the, uh, the other thing is that uh, ecology is a, a very rough subject. It tells you there is an energetic efficiency as you climb up the ecological pri pyramid. So, uh, herbivores, those things that are eating plants, are uh, utilizing only 10% of the input energy relative to what the primary producers, the, 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 the plants, are doing. So it's very inefficient to rear cattle and these things, not to mention the fact that cattle are producing a lot of methane, which is ha a more than 100-fold more efficient greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, right? So. Uh, one, so you have to change many attitudes because otherwise there will be a disaster. And one of the attitudes is that you have to, you have to cut down on the production of, uh, of meat in the traditional way because I think it's not sustainable. And finally, you have the problem uh, with, the, with the ecological footprint. The ecological fruit, footprint means uh, per year how much uh, land see uh, you are using uh, as a kind of natural capital in order to sustain your life. Now, you can have a ranking of the countries um, um, per capita, per capita, and I'm ashamed to say that according to the ranking, for example, uh, uh, Belgium, you know, where the seat of the e European Union is, is coming, uh, coming up fourth. Then the USA is coming up fifth. Uh, you might be uh, slightly happier because Singapore is towards the end of one third. Hungary is somewhere in the middle. But that's not the main problem. The main problem is that if you count, if you take the food, the big food, right? If you, if you take the big food, that big food is stepping on the earth because now uh, the ecological footprint of civilization is 1.5 times the existing natural capital of the Earth. Now, you can make it out that's not going to work out in the long run, right? So I'm warning you, we have to do something about it. So we have to uh, do, uh, for the future, we have to concentrate on a number of things. Uh, we have to deal with the uh, species extinction problem and the bi uh, preserving ecosystems and biosphere. And to this, we are linking many problems of the human population. What kind of population numbers are, will be sustainable at the level of the human population? Of course, you can argue it depends many thi on many things. If everybody eats just rice, oh, well, you can go up to 20 billion. But does everybody, everybody eat, uh, want to eat just rice? That's quite unlikely. So uh, there is something to be solved about this problem. But it is true that the increasing uh, human population is also increasing the species extinction. In it increases the ecological footprint. And ultimately, if you are going to get into a self-reinforcing spiral, a, a positive feedback. And that has to be cut somehow. Now, how can you uh, 
uh, how can you cut it? You can cut it in several ways. Um, one of the things uh, that is interesting is the species resurrection uh, idea. You know, the, here is a guy who has already died out, but it, it's likely that with genetic engineering methods, we might be able to resurrect it. But the condition is that you know and you have available DNA, although it's an extinct species. But most of the, for most of the extinct, extinct species, you are not going to have that, right? Because they go extinct before you could sequence them. So there will be, there's a lot of work to be done in order to catch up with the speed of extinction and then trying, possibly, to install the mechanisms, and it needs a lot of money, for the resurrection of them. Human longevity. Uh, first of all, uh, how are you going to sustain it? Because if that's the case, all of a sudden there will be an incredible amount of you know, more and more aging people after which you uh, can look after. And as uh, one of the panelists said, um, how would you feel if you remained at the assistant professor level for 150 years? Uh, so, uh, you, but as it's a joke, but of course, you can, th you can think it over. It, it entails many, many other things. Now, but I have to warn you, don't, don't believe those sirenic voices who will say, okay, just give me $100, I will do something to you, and then you will live up to 150 or 200 years. It's absolute uh, nonsense uh, because, you see, there are several mechanisms if, in your body, and the sad fact is that because of evolution, they go wrong roughly at the same speed, right? So if you single out one, you might get a mileage, but you might actually extend the li your life in such a way that it's not worth it because the deterioration of the others is, makes you so crippled that it's not worth the extension. So it, the extension has to be done in a balanced way, and that's going to be very difficult. Uh, finally, uh, you can ask the question, so, what is the stumbling block? Where is the stumbling block? Why do we just still marching uh, forward, still despite many agreements, towards maybe an end game? And, uh, you know, one of the things that I asked some of the, uh, one of our distinguished panelists, um, you see, you have this problem uh, with the increasing ecological food spin, the, the, you know, the, the declining uh, natural capital. And there are the economists who are always uh, talking about, uh, about economic growth, right? So uh, they don't somehow match, right? It's, this is not a, uh, something that for a biologist makes a lot of sense. Now, the point is that I was told, and I'm very glad that actually an increasing number of economists say that you cannot have economic growth at the expense of a declining biota. Economic growth has to be limited to those cases where the biota is still preserved. That's excellent. So where is the problem? The problem, I'm afraid, is more at the political level. The politicians, you see, uh, th there is a problem with democracy in the sense that they always take, you know, a, a perspective that is roughly four years you know, in between <laughs> the elections. In the first year, they don't find the toilet in the ministry. In the second year, they do some. Oh, okay, third year, end of third year, we prepare for the next elections. But we are not running on that time scale, I am afraid. Right? So th there is something to, uh, to, to be done to advise the politicians so that they actually believe and understand that there is something very, uh, there is a very serious problem and you just should not, you know, think about the increasing uh, your GDP because you have the proverbial case when there is a poor country with a lot of forests, it cuts down all the forest and the next year you see that the GDP has gone up by 100%. Yeah, but what happens after that? Thank you very much for your attention.